We say that in every act of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs discover or create information. And the other day, we began to discuss the characteristics of the type of information or knowledge entrepreneurs generate when they act. We looked at the first characteristic. We said that entrepreneurs discover or create knowledge that is subjective, practical and non-scientific. In addition, we introduced a table to show the dichotomy between two different types of knowledge. Scientific knowledge, which is centralized, can be generally agreed upon and pertains to classes of phenomena and, in contrast, subjective, entrepreneurial knowledge, which is practical, cannot be acquired from books and instead can only be obtained through the exercise of action itself in particular circumstances of time and place. We could say that the only way to gain entrepreneurial knowledge is to use it. Entrepreneurial knowledge pertains to unique events which are historically unrepeatable and it is knowledge that cannot be expressed in words. We concluded that success in life does not depend as much on knowledge that can be acquired from books, articulate or scientific knowledge as on practical entrepreneurial knowledge. Then I posed a rather tricky question to you. I asked you to tell me which type of knowledge I am transmitting to you, which type of knowledge scientific knowledge of economics is. Obviously, it is scientific knowledge, but we obtain it by studying, in formal terms, the flow of entrepreneurial creativity, the processes of discovery, creation and transmission of the practical knowledge or information that we human beings constantly generate when we act. Entrepreneurial knowledge is exclusive and dispersed. What do I mean by this? When I say it is exclusive, I mean that each human being, each one of us, every man, every woman, possesses, as it were, a few atoms or bits of the information used in society. That is, a tiny amount of all the subjective, practical information people continually generate, discover, handle and use in society. But that small part, I say atoms or bits to use a metaphor from the natural sciences and such metaphors are always dangerous, that small part available to each person is private. It is exclusive to that particular person. To put it another way, what you know, what you have here in your mind, and what you have in yours, and what this young woman has in hers, is exclusive or private. Why is this so? Each person starts out with a set of specific circumstances that are historically unrepeatable. They will never exist in exactly the same form in the life of any other human being. They do not exist now in any other human being's life, in any part of the world, nor have they ever existed in precisely the same form in the past, nor will they ever exist in precisely the same form in the future. In other words, our entrepreneurial view of the world, in terms of where we live and the circumstances that surround us, not only our genetic inheritance, but also our influences, the experiences we have had, the ways we have shaped them into memories and the ways we can recombine them in the mixer, blender or cocktail shaker of our mind to creatively imagine the future in the form of entrepreneurial expectations is a view that no one else will ever fully share because the knowledge we each start out with is exclusive, it is private. This should make us feel both proud and a little dizzy. What I am saying is that no matter how similar we may think other people are to us, they can never be identical to us, at least not from the perspective of entrepreneurship, because they each start out with experiences, knowledge and circumstances that can never be an exact duplicate of ours. To put it another way, we are unique in the universe. We are unique as to our view of our surroundings and as to our capacity for creativity and entrepreneurship. It is in this sense that entrepreneurial knowledge is not only practical, as we saw last week, 
but also private, exclusive to each one of us. In fact, this is a huge responsibility because it means that if an entrepreneurial idea has occurred to us, perhaps no one else has thought of it in exactly the same form with all the same nuances, with all the same subtleties, and that if we do not take advantage of that act of entrepreneurial creativity, a creative approach of enormous importance in the world may be frustrated. If we miss the bus when one passes through our lives, we may never have another chance of catching it, and what is more, no one may ever have a chance of catching it. Therefore, from the standpoint of entrepreneurship, we must each accept our own exclusive individuality, in terms of the private nature of the knowledge that we alone can create. And that depends on the lookout tower from which we see the world, a tower which cannot exist with the very same characteristics in the life of any other human being. I repeat, it is not only that it cannot exist today, it is also that no one in the past has ever shared, nor will anyone in the future ever share, in every detail, the same circumstances that determine our entrepreneurial creativity on a personal human level. Also, the knowledge we are discussing is not exclusive only in this sense. We can also describe it as dispersed knowledge. Hayek often refers to dispersed or divided knowledge. As we will soon see, we all cooperate, and by doing so, we generate a massive, constantly changing flow of entrepreneurial knowledge. And this flow of knowledge is what moves civilization forward, as if through a limitless expansion, a Big Bang. I call it a coordinated social Big Bang, which is always expanding. We all cooperate, and we benefit from a vast volume of knowledge or information, which, nevertheless, is not at our disposal, for of the immense, continually recent entrepreneurial knowledge that we use on a social level, only a tiny part is available to us and that is the part that we can see or create. In this sense, we say that the entrepreneurial knowledge all human beings use throughout the social process is dispersed or divided into small parts. So there's a part in your mind, another in mine, another in mine, and so on. It is dispersed knowledge that cannot be centralized. Someone might claim it could be possible to invent a machine, a gigantic computer with a helmet attached to it by a cable, and we could put the helmet on the head of Vincent here and flip a switch and zap! Everything he knows, bam, would be transferred to my brain. And then it would be your turn to wear the helmet. And one by one, we'd put it on everyone. And we could suck out all the knowledge exclusive to each human being and transfer this knowledge to our gigantic machine, where we would centrally manage it. That is the socialist ideal sought by those who would attempt to manage society from above through coercive commands and be successful at it. But it is a theoretically impossible ideal. This is precisely because the knowledge we are discussing cannot be expressed in words. It cannot be centralized or transferred to any machine. And besides, it is dispersed or divided. Each of us has, so to speak, a few bits or atoms, an infinitesimal part. And as we go along, we create this information according to our unique, exclusive view of the world. Dispersed knowledge, which is entrepreneurial knowledge, versus centralized knowledge, which is scientific or technical knowledge, engineering knowledge, the type used by engineers or by bureaucrats who want to centralize everything. So, what we must come to understand the great wonder we must discover together this year is how, since knowledge is dispersed and the leading role in its creation is played by us, like little ants, each with an exclusive view of the world, it is possible for everything to come together in such a way that each of us can take advantage of the knowledge he or she lacks. In fact, the great contribution of economic science is that it explains how such a thing is possible, and that is what I am going to explain today. today I am wearing a Swiss watch. I know nothing about Swiss watches, but nevertheless, there is an enormous volume of practical information accumulated here. Regarding design, tradition, inner workings, etc., I am also wearing a suit made by a Madrid tailor, but the raw material came from Tunisia, and I am wearing a pair of shoes that were made, who knows, maybe in Italy or somewhere else. And though you cannot see them, I am wearing state-of-the-art bifocal contact lenses, that I never have to take out, because they are 98% water. Do you realize the enormous volume of creative, entrepreneurial information I am benefiting from, tapping into, 
or using in those four examples alone without knowing anything about the items myself. And can you imagine the thousands upon thousands of human beings, little ants, who by making their own small contributions of practical knowledge have made it possible for me to wear my contact lenses and for you to wear your glasses and for you to wear your swatch watch and for you to write with that pencil, and for all of us to use the items that are part of our everyday lives. I am offering the most mundane examples, but we benefit from many thousands of goods and services. This is what we are going to learn this year. We will see how, without possessing this huge, constantly changing wealth of entrepreneurial knowledge that arises from the creativity of entrepreneurs, of each and every one of us when we act, we nevertheless benefit or take advantage of this knowledge. We will see what processes or I was going to say mechanisms, but I do not like mechanistic terms, though we have no other in this case, we will see what processes make this possible. On many occasions, the behavior of human beings is contradictory. That is what I wish to show with the stick men I introduce on page 21 of the book. We could say these figures are part of a stick man analysis, an economic analysis using stick man. So instead of filling up the blackboard with charts, mathematics and formulas, I fill it up with stick man. They are a simplified representation of ordinary human beings, like each and every one of us. Well, in the process of entrepreneurial creativity, we not only generate exclusive and dispersed entrepreneurial knowledge, but we also often generate contradictory actions. This happens when the actions of some people are incompatible or out of tune with those of other people. What we will see together this year is how the entrepreneurial social process of a free market economy permits us to take advantage of a huge volume of entrepreneurial creativity that is not at our disposal, but springs from other people. And we will see that this process is not only creative, but also coordinating. In other words, it tends to detect maladjusted behaviors and overcome maladjustments or discoordination by coordinating the behaviors. And this all happens spontaneously, without anyone's coercively bringing it about from above. I am explaining the essence of social science, the essence of the social phenomenon which is our object of study, and is also a surprising wonder. It is surprising that, without anyone's direction from above, spontaneously, creativity is stimulated, and maladjusted or discoordinated processes are coordinated. Many times, the dispersed knowledge we possess is maladjusted. That is what I am illustrating here. We will use this halo of short lines to represent the exclusive, practical, entrepreneurial knowledge of this man or woman, this human being, A, and here the practical knowledge of B. And we will suppose that in certain specific circumstances of time and place, that practical knowledge is that A intends to achieve an end, X. And the arrow that points to X indicates, in this diagram, the end pursued. As you know, the end is what motivates the actor to act. A is very upset because he realizes that to achieve the end X, he needs a resource, a means, R. Let us recall that we defined the means as anything the actor subjectively believes will enable him to accomplish his desired end. He values the end and assigns utility to the means, depending on the value of the end he believes the means will permit him to accomplish. Why is A upset? Because according to the knowledge he has at this moment, he cannot achieve the end X, because he lacks the resource R. So, he cannot do it. He is frustrated. He cannot complete his action. Well, let us suppose that somewhere else in the market, and when I say somewhere else in the market, I am speaking in a praxeological sense. We mustn't be materialists. We mustn't think of geographical places. They could be right next to each other. I'll give you an example from the movies in a moment. Somewhere else, in a praxeological sense, in terms of human action, we find B, who is pursuing a completely different end. I have indicated it with an arrow that points down to the end Y. Furthermore, there is the following circumstance. Resource R is available to her in great abundance. She has a tremendous amount of it, but she attaches no importance to it, and she wastes it. She sees it like the curse of Texas. Do you know what the curse of Texas was? 
Well, before the discovery of the internal combustion engine, the main source of wealth in Texas was livestock, vast expanses of farmland where people raised cattle, many head of cattle. But it turns out there was a curse on Texas with respect to many parts of the United States, because from time to time, no one knew why, it was a mystery, a blackish, oily substance would ooze out of the ground into pools, namely oil. And if the cattle got close, and the oil mixed with the water, and the cattle drank the water, bam, the cattle would die. The poor stock breeders did not know what to do with it, except misuse it. Land was worth much less when that curse was upon it. In any case, they would light a match to it when they could, and poof, maybe it would go up in flames, and they could free themselves from the curse. One person misuses precisely the resource that in another praxeological place, another person urgently needs to accomplish a much-valued end. When one person, depending upon his or her circumstances, misuses a resource that another person desperately needs, we say there is discoordination or a maladjustment. I could cite thousands of examples. For instance, there is a law on income from urban property, and this law prevents a free market in rentals. So there could be an elderly couple who live in Madrid's Salamanca district in a 500 square meter apartment with 20 rooms, 15 of which are always kept closed. And at the same time, there could be a newlywed couple with a child living in a cramped 40 square meter apartment in the Vicalvaro district. Some people misuse what other people desperately need, or perhaps we live near a river. And since the river is not private, and those who live upstream cannot sell their water, they do not appreciate it. They channel into the watering basin all they need for irrigation, and on top of that, they neglect it and waste it all. They have no incentive to save water. However, the Mercians, who live downstream, happen to need water like a spring shower, an appropriate expression, because they live in a very dry area. Some people waste what other people need. Or maybe I go to the movies feeling depressed because my girlfriend has left me. Oh, if I could only find the woman of my dreams, with such and such physical and spiritual characteristics, etc. I buy my ticket, and it turns out there is another girl who has those characteristics, because life is full of circumstances, and she buys a ticket and sits down next to me. The lights go down, and we both watch the movie. Just imagine. We are sitting right next to each other physically, but we may be light years away from each other in terms of praxeological human action. And when the movie is over, we may each go our own way and never meet. And yet we are perfect for each other. Or perhaps we do meet. We may have a chance encounter. That is why I say that it is not physical nearness that matters but other places, in a praxeological sense, in terms of human action. As we will see, though I do not want us to get ahead of ourselves, the social process drives human creativity when we act, and gives rise to an inconceivable and constantly growing volume of new ideas about ends, means, etc. Ideas which move civilization forward, and which are only available to us in a tiny amount and are exclusive, though we can still take advantage of this enormous volume of ideas as if we ourselves had created them, when we did not. Think of the examples of the watch, the suit, etc. Furthermore, we will see that whenever there is a maladjustment or social discoordination arises, there is also a very powerful incentive for the entrepreneurial act to uncover the maladjustment and achieve coordination. Now for the third characteristic of entrepreneurial knowledge. Entrepreneurial knowledge is tacit and inarticulate. What does this mean? It means that entrepreneurial action teaches us how to perform certain actions. It shows us how to acquire practical habits of behavior, what English speakers call know-how. So, we set out to gain some know-how, and there is a learning curve, and we need practice. 
we are developing habits of conduct, know-how. But we do not come to know exactly, in scientific or technical terms, the elements of our knowledge, how they relate to each other, nor the foundations they rest on. Knowledge of facts like these is called know that, and we could give many examples of know-how. For instance, I remember how I learned to ride a bicycle. I will never forget it. I was small, four or five years old. It was in El Escorial, not San Lorenzo, but El Escorial de Ebayo. My parents had a house in a residential area called Prado Tornero. At any rate, they bought my sister a girl's bike. Back then, there used to be girl's bikes and boy's bikes. For some mysterious reason, boy's bikes used to have a horizontal bar that was very uncomfortable, especially if you fell onto it. However, girls' bikes had a curved frame, supposedly to make room for their skirts. Girls' bikes were much more comfortable. Anyway, I wanted to learn to ride a bike. How do you think I learned to ride a bike? You must be one of those who fell onto the bar, am I right? Okay. So, how did I learn to ride a bike? Did my father buy me a manual? Did I say to him, get me a manual on how to ride a bike? Did I study the manual? No one has ever learned to ride a bike that way. What I did was, I boldly got on my sister's bike, once they had taken off the training wheels, and I tried to ride down a hill. And you know what happened? I took a terrible fall. I skinned my leg up to my knee and went home crying, Ow! Mummy! Mummy! Well, for a while I stayed away from the bicycle. But my goal was to learn, because I wanted to know how to ride a bike, like the big kids. And so I pointed the bike down the hill again and again and again, until somehow, mysteriously, I managed to keep my balance and not fall. In other words, I developed the practical habit of entrepreneurial conduct that enabled me to ride a bicycle. How many times did Miguel Induran win the Tour de France? Five. Do you think Induran knows the formulas of mathematical physics that permit him to keep his balance and not fall? That is, does he know the precise angle at which he needs to lean the bike, so that in a curve, the centrifugal force will keep him stuck to the ground and he won't fall? And does he enter these formulas into a computer, along with the specific data of bicycle weight and speed, the wind that day, etc.? And does the computer then automatically calculate the results and send them to the bike, so that the automatic pilot can... No, no. What Induran has developed is practical knowledge on how to ride a bicycle. He has tacit knowledge. It's like when you know something, but you don't know how you know it. It's like when a young woman, any of my students perhaps, goes to buy a dress. My daughters go to Zara. They tell me, Dad, Zara has all the latest fashions, and the clothes are cheap, so I can buy them and get rid of them. And they are always at Zara. Zara is everywhere. In Vienna, there is a huge Zara store. And in Bratislava, at the Zara store, it comes to blows, people fighting over the dresses. Quite a curious phenomenon, Zara. The other day, the CEO of El Corte Inglés said to me, very sadly, they've stolen 200 billion of the former pesetas from us in sales. They haven't stolen the money. They are satisfying the desires of consumers better than anybody. Would it be possible to perfectly articulate some knowledge and put it into a book called Treatise on the Clothing that Looks Good on Me? No. When you go shopping, you rely on your know-how, your intuition. This looks good on me, but I can't see myself in that. It looks bad on me. But if someone asked you, can you tell me precisely why it looks good or bad on you, what the logical reasons are, you might be able to say, well, it makes me look really short, or it makes my butt look big, or it's too tight. The fact is, you know, or think you know, what looks good, and that is practical knowledge. The fashion industry always works that way, and the companies that offer the different styles use the trial and error method. Some items are successful, and others are not, but there is no manual, because on Entrepreneurial knowledge is not scientific knowledge, it is tacit knowledge. In the book, I give the example of golf. Why? Well, every Sunday, I play golf. I am a terrible golfer. At the beginning of the season, I start out playing relatively well, and with each passing Sunday, my game gets worse. By the time the season ends in July, I am hopeless. Golf is a game that was invented by the English, and therefore, it is unnatural. The English are a wacky people. You have to grip the club in a very counterintuitive way. The 
dominant arm is the left arm. You can't move your head during the backswing because if you do, you won't hit the ball. You have to pull your arms back until right where your chin touches this shoulder. And then you have to come down like this with your left arm but without moving your body because if you move it and then your first impulse is to look to see where the ball goes. But if you look to see where the ball goes, you botch it because then you won't hit the ball. You have to stay there like this without looking where the ball goes. In short, it's an English thing. And no matter how many books and treatises you read about this English thing, the only way to learn how to do it is to stand there swinging like a schmuck, like I do. And when you've swung the club a thousand times, you say to yourself, what am I doing? This is ridiculous. And that's when you start to get the hang of it. You develop a habit and you start hitting the ball, hopefully. That's what we hope for, but it can be pretty complicated. Practical habits of conduct. As I have mentioned in class, human relationships are also practical habits of conduct. In relationships, we learn by doing, and each person must adapt these habits to his or her own circumstances. The best way to attract a girl or a guy is not the same for everyone. What works for one person and guarantees his or her success does not necessarily guarantee the success of someone else. As I have said, we are all worlds unto ourselves, and each of us is unrepeatable. If I see that a guy is very successful and I try to copy his behavior exactly, I may fail miserably. I may be the laughing stock of all the girls and not say a word to them, and vice versa. Why? Because only by developing tacit, inarticulate knowledge, which comes from taking a chance again and again in specific circumstances of time and place, can I develop my entrepreneurial creativity. The same is true for getting a particular enterprise off the ground in the business or commercial sphere, and for helping our neighbors in need, and for acting in the areas of philanthropy and religion. There are thousands of different ways of doing things, even within the sphere of a particular religion. Suddenly, someone has a vision. He says, let's form the order of preachers. We'll go out and preach in twos. And so it was. St. Dominic, the Dominicans, and another order, the Franciscans, and another. But what is this? This is anarchy. Each, f each person forms whatever religious order he wants. There was another man, one who was sought by the Inquisition and briefly thrown in jail. Afterwards, he went to Paris, a great paranoiac, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Jesuits, who are organized like an army and place themselves at the Pope's disposal for whatever he might want them to do. And what is the reason for this? What do these people have to do with the others? What is the relationship between them? And then suddenly another man appeared, Monsignor Escrivá de Balaguer, and once he had been canonized, and the Opus Dei seemed very successful, yet another man came on the scene. He was playing the guitar, and his name is Kiko Argello. What is this? Well, everyone has his or her own view of the world. And in the end, though it appears a mess, as long as a basic structure of principles is accepted and maintained, time will tell. It's a sort of free market. Maybe what is successful in certain historical circumstances of time and place is not so necessary in others, but we don't know. Maybe what stands the test of time is what prevails. Life is beautiful precisely because it is extraordinarily rich in entrepreneurial creativity and therefore complex. If there is a purpose to the articulate knowledge we can acquire in elementary school, in high school, in college, in books, and through the effort we all make to come to class every day, this purpose is precisely to act as a sort of springboard, like at the swimming pool, for boosting our capacity for entrepreneurial creativity. In other words, a person who has a computer and articulate knowledge at his or her disposal has access to much more raw material than can stimulate his or her entrepreneurial creativity. Maps, charts and the like greatly increase our capacity to create tacit knowledge. And we know that tacit knowledge is different from scientific knowledge and also far more important or relevant. Let's say we're going to plan a trip for our next school break. We are going to go to Navarre on location. We could go blindly, or we could plan our trip a little with the help of scientific knowledge. <laughs> so, we go on the internet, and we see what routes there are, and we see what kinds of hotels there are, and whether they have one, two, or three stars. We request brochures and download a map, and with that information as a basis, we enhance our creative possibilities. Oh, look, it says here on the map there's a convent or a monastery we could go visit. I hadn't thought of that. Serendipity. Well, let's go. Let's stop and see it. 
The scientific knowledge you gain here does not guarantee you anything once you get out into the real world. What it does provide you with is a technical grounding, which, if put to good entrepreneurial use, can boost your creativity. It gives you building blocks for your creativity, but it does not guarantee you anything. As a matter of fact, even without any of these building blocks, you can become a magnificent entrepreneur. I once knew an entrepreneur, the King of Light. I won't mention his name. He didn't know how to read or write. He was Spanish. With great difficulty, he learned to sign his name. And he used to try to look natural when he signed checks, etc. But he was a genius from the entrepreneurial standpoint. He had a clinical eye, a very sharp entrepreneurial eye for hiring collaborators, people far more learned than he. But he was the entrepreneur, it was clear. And he made it to the top without having hardly any of even the rudiments of scientific or technical knowledge. It is not necessary to go to college to achieve entrepreneurial success in life, in any sphere in which human beings can act. However, we must admit that if it is used well, the technical knowledge we acquire in the classroom can boost our capacity to create tacit, inarticulate knowledge in the future. We need to connect this idea of tacit knowledge with the concept of institutions, which we talked about in an earlier class. We said that human beings have two tools to help us face the ineradicably uncertain future. First, our own entrepreneurial capacity, which tends to bring us closer to what we want to achieve our ends, though there is no guarantee. And second, institutions, which are repetitive, patterned behaviors we learn with practice, frameworks of behavioral guidelines. Well, the knowledge of institutions is also tacit, inarticulate knowledge. There is a very clear example. I remember the first time I went to the United States. My wife had just completed a master's degree and she was working at a children's school. I used to pick her up from time to time and I was surprised at how well the three-year-old American children spoke English. But these three-year-olds speak English a thousand times better than I do. And I've spent hours and hours studying books, studying vocabulary, studying grammar, and I don't know even a tenth of what a child three or four years old knows. They conjugated verbs perfectly, just as a Spanish four-year-old conjugates the most complicated subjunctives you can think of, and a five-year-old knows even more than that. Try having a conversation with someone who has learned Spanish as a second language, as an adult. He or she has learned it by studying technical knowledge, while a child learns a language by practice. From the time children are small, they hear language and they see how it is used in interaction with their parents, their siblings and their friends. Later, schools simply strengthen and refine what children already have. Language is basically tacit, inarticulate knowledge. In addition, the habits, traditions and institutions that make up legal and moral standards, law, morality, are also practical, entrepreneurial, non-scientific knowledge, and we learn to follow them at a young age. They are instilled in us, in our families, and later in small, social community groups. Afterward, they may be reinforced by religious feelings, etc. We cannot articulate in scientific terms the specific role legal and moral standards play on a social level. And yet they play a vital role. We sense only the tip of the iceberg. But we have developed these pattern behaviors, and we know right from wrong. And we know that we come closer to achieving our ends if we adopt these pattern behaviors. Accounting is a language, and it enables entrepreneurs to assess whether they have made a profit or sustained a loss in the past, and to set a budget for the future. Nobody invented the Spanish language. It emerged as a result of an evolutionary process, and some would say it is a corruption of Latin. It is believed that the first forms of Castilian were used in the north of Burgos, and they took many generations, centuries, to emerge. The same is true of accounting. 
The first instances of double entry accounting were discovered in books found in Egypt, books dating from the Ptolemaic period. It was many centuries later that someone actually theorized about what had already tacitly evolved and taken shape. For example, in the sphere of accounting, there was a mathematician and Franciscan monk who taught mathematics to Leonardo da Vinci, Luca Pacioli. People say he discovered accounting. Not true. He theorized about it. He found out what entrepreneurs were doing and he systematized it in his treatise on double entry accounting. Just as a treatise on linguistics systemizes what three-year-old children already know and so on. In any case, please note the tacit inarticulate nature of the knowledge entrepreneurs generate, the importance of this knowledge, and also the fact that it provides the raw material for the most essential institutions, which make life in society possible. And this makes us quite dizzy, because it turns out that the institutions most crucial for us, language, legal standards, law, morality, etc., have not been created deliberately, nor can they be expressed in words. Instead, they are the result of an evolutionary process in which human beings manifest their nature through a successive change of countless entrepreneurial acts. There's an idea that God suddenly called out to Moses, and Moses went up the mountain, and God said, Here, take these tablets, and Moses went back down with the commandments. Okay, everybody, here are the commandments. This is a symbolic way of speaking, not a literal account. There is an evolutionary process that involves millions of human beings over generations and generations, thousands and thousands of years, in which we gradually discover, through entrepreneurship, which behaviors are successful and which are not. When something is already there, it is very easy to theorize about it, we could mention the sphere of money. Once it is there, it is very easy for the state to expropriate and manipulate it, and we will see the effects of such measures. They generate expansions and bubbles, and later financial crises and economic recessions. For when we insist on improving the spontaneous process of entrepreneurial creativity from above, we destroy it. That is another of the paradoxes we will learn about in this course. If we insist, in a rationalist manner, on creating our institutions ex novo, or on forcing the predominance of the knowledge that can be articulated in books over entrepreneurial knowledge, we destroy civilization. If I refuse to let anyone ride a bicycle unless he or she had first learned the formulas of mathematical physics, and unless a personal computer monitored everything, there would be no Tour de France nor would Induran ever have appeared, nor Beethoven, nor Schubert, nor Mother Teresa of Calcutta. On to the next characteristic of entrepreneurial knowledge. Such knowledge is essentially creative. As we will see, it has two facets, which are like two sides of the same coin the creative facet and the coordinating facet. What do we mean when we say entrepreneurial knowledge is essentially creative? Well, I'll say it again. We're dealing with something astonishing and awe-inspiring. Indeed, today we will be discovering one amazing thing after another. For to exercise entrepreneurship, we do not need to have any means at our disposal. An act of entrepreneurship does not involve any cost at all. In this sense, entrepreneurship is especially creative. The very discovery of a profit opportunity involves an implicit profit. For example, it could be Mr. A who suddenly comes to a realization. Hey, Miss B is right there. She's very close by and she has just what I need. Or it could be Miss B who says to herself, hey, I'm squandering this resource when Mr. A needs it. It could also be a third party. To help us visualize and illustrate the argument, let's suppose it is a third party, Mr. C. Let's suppose it is Mr. C or Ms. C and that the entrepreneurial act simply consists of discovering, 
recognizing or perceiving something that only a fraction of a second before had gone unnoticed, namely that there is a profit opportunity. We'll represent this discovery as a bulb that lights up. Eureka! Look at that! In my specific circumstances of time and place, and for whatever reason, I have realized that one person here is wasting resource R, which she throws out, while another person here needs it desperately. Right there, in that creative act, lies an implicit, pure entrepreneurial profit, and the exercise of creative entrepreneurship does not require us to have any means at our disposal. It only requires us to be alert, to have that sharp gaze that enables us to see what is going to happen. The other day we were saying that the etymological meanings of the Spanish words perspicaz and especulador, speculator, are associated both with sharp vision from a watchtower and with a person who keeps watch to notice what is happening. As is logical, the entrepreneurial act is not just noticing something, we must also get to work. The entrepreneurial act is really very simple. Mr. C goes to Ms. B and says, I'll buy your resource. And the day the woman hears that, she jumps for joy. So, this curse, I was willing to pay somebody to get this black muck off my land, and now it turns out I not only do not have to pay anyone, but someone's going to pay me. This is the happiest day of my life. And on top of that, this crazy guy, to be honest, I'm a little ashamed. This guy doesn't really know what he's doing. I guess it takes all kinds. He's going to pay me three monetary units. I feel bad for him. I almost have a guilt complex. I just give it to you. But the profit motive being what it is, if he pays me three, well, I'll certainly take it. So Mr. C pays Ms. B three monetary units and she hands over the resource. And then what does Mr. C do? He goes to Mr. A and he says, look how sad you are. You can't achieve your end, X, because you don't have the resource. I found it for you for 10. And Mr. A cries, this is the happiest day of my life. I was willing to pay a hundred for it. And this guy comes and sells it to me for 10? I feel almost guilty. I have a heavy heart, as if I were doing something wrong. Maybe I have committed a venial or mortal sin in not telling him I would pay him 200. Then Mr. C gives Mr. A resource R, which he bought from Ms. B, and Mr. A pays Mr. C the 10 monetary units. As a result, Mr. C has gained 10 minus 3, or 7 monetary units of pure entrepreneurial profit. Now you'll say, Professor, what do you mean it's not necessary to have any means at one's disposal? Mr. C needs to pay 3 before he can sell, but he doesn't really need to have them, because the creative idea is enough. He can go to a third party and say, listen, I have a fantastic idea. Will you lend me three monetary units at 10% interest? At 10%? You're crazy. That's madness, etc. For one day? That's usury. No, really, lend it to me. In one day, I'm going to gain seven. The rest has to do with the concrete operation of the different action stages. But in the entrepreneurial discovery of the prior maladjustment, the pure entrepreneurial profit is already implicit. Just think how amazing that is. I've laid it all out for you. For in that entrepreneurial process, by which exclusive and dispersed knowledge is created, in other words, the market process, which gives rise to the limitless advancement of civilization, any maladjustment or discoordination, like in the example we've discussed here in simple terms, emerges as a latent opportunity for profit, an opportunity waiting to be discovered by an entrepreneur, whether A, B, or a third party. Then, all of the entrepreneurial impetus to obtain a profit sets us in motion to discover maladjustments and discoordination, contradictory behaviors, and coordinate them. This happens without any need for a ministry, an engineer, a prime minister, a bureaucrat, or a planner who insists on doing it. And so, this man who is so sad, we're going to wipe away his sadness, like this. How does he feel now? Very happy. And how does she feel? Very happy. I will never forget, when I was studying for my MBA in the United States, I don't like to get up early. Every day I study until late at night, until two in the morning, and I get up late. Anyway, I had my first class of the day early in the morning, at 8.30 and I went like a zombie. My wife would drive me there in the car, and I was like a zombie, 
half asleep, we would head to the university. We lived relatively close and we would stop at each traffic light and we would stop right behind an annoying garbage truck driver who was collecting the garbage. And on the back of the garbage truck, written in English, there was a message that said, the trash you throw away is our mainstay. Thank you very much. Early every morning, this man collected the trash nobody wanted and it was his main source of income. Thank you very much. The curse of Texas. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. To sum up what we're discussing today, what I'd like to point out to you now is that every entrepreneurial act produces three extremely important, indeed vital effects. And these effects lie at the heart of the knowledge economics can provide about the market process. The three effects that result from the entrepreneurial act. First, the creation of information. Second, the transmission or communication of information. And third, coordination or adjustment. Before me, there have been other economists and schools that have focused on entrepreneurship, but always partially. For example, Joseph Alois Schumpeter. Schumpeter talks about the process of creative destruction in capitalism. He examines the process of creativity and sees it as a gale that is often destructive. This is a partial view. Though, in a sense, it is a step forward with respect to the throng, the majority of economists who remain confined to their mathematical models in a frozen world of equilibrium adjustment, a world devoid of entrepreneurs. Another economist, a Nobel Prize winner named Douglas North, concentrates solely on the coordinating quality of the entrepreneurial act. Notice how I have described the three effects. First, creation, to which Schumpeter limits his incomplete analysis. Second, communication or transmission. And third, coordination. Creation and coordination. Gale and order. Two sides of the same entrepreneurial coin. Let's consider each effect separately. We'll begin with the creation of information. Every act of entrepreneurship involves the creation, the creation from nothing, ex novo, ex nihilo, of information we had been unaware of until then. A fraction of a second earlier, we hadn't thought of the entrepreneurial project. The moment we think of it, new knowledge is created in our minds. And I can't tell you why, for such an explanation would be meta-economic. Maybe within the limits of psychology, a person could have some intuitions about it. Why is it that any of us, you or me, can create things? The other day I was saying that we use our recollections of the past as building blocks. We feel restless because in this part of our minds, though that's a rough way of putting it, we have this knowledge and in this part we have this other knowledge and we are restless and can't sleep until... Eureka! We connect the two and it occurs to us that we could do a certain thing. Why do we have this capacity? Theorists of computer science and artificial intelligence would say, well, it's like this. The human brain contains 150 billion neurons, approximately. It's like having several million personal computers connected in a network and working at the same time. Imagine that in one computer there is a certain bit of information which indicates that a particular thing could be done. And in another computer, X millions of computers away from the first one, imagine they're all connected in a horizontal line, there is another bit of information, and the two bits can be connected, and something of value results. Well, we don't know why we are able to create. Maybe we turn an idea over and over in our subconscious until we see the idea clearly. We can sense how the creation process works. The brain truly is a wondrous thing, and we can think of it in terms of computers, as a network of 150 billion neurons. But society is even more wondrous. According to Hayek, it is the most complex order in the universe because it consists of 7 billion people, each of whom has a brain with 150 billion neurons in it. Do you realize how much creativity that is? Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Schubert's Eighth Symphony, the Unfinished, Vorjak's Eighth Symphony, Las Meninas by Velazquez, Windows 95 by Bill Gates, Mother Teresa of Calcutta. In all areas, there is a surprising force of creativity. We create ex nihilo, from nothing, and I can't explain why. Why don't monkeys create in the same way? Or dogs? Well, the materialists, 
though I don't want us to get ahead of ourselves, because we will discuss this when we talk about method a few lessons from now, the materialists believe the basic elements determine the spirit. I will show the opposite is true. The spirit determines the basic elements. We are unable to reproduce our own minds. It is beyond our capacity. We will talk about this when we study hierarchical orders. We have only sparks and intuitions. The strategy of computer scientists during a certain period in the last century was to build a super mainframe, a gigantic supercomputer. Come on! Bigger! 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 A truly gigantic computer! And that would be equivalent to a central planning agency. But, it turns out, they couldn't compete with a man who had a small personal computer that could be connected to another, and another, and another. Large computers organized hierarchically from above. Our minds are not made that way. They are decentralized and dispersed in nature. But it is not biology that comes to the aid of economics. It is economics that comes to the aid of biology and computer science by pointing out where creativity lies and what paths it takes. Every entrepreneurial act is especially creative. In fact, this is what I want to show with the light bulb. Eureka! I've got it! I'm sitting in a movie theater. Hey, that girl! Or the perfume. Or I make some silly little comment and she answers me. And it changes my life. I have made an entrepreneurial discovery. Or not. Maybe the light bulb doesn't go on for me. And we both go our separate ways and an opportunity is lost. What sort of information is created? Well, in the case of Mr. C, the entrepreneur who discovers the profit opportunity latent in the maladjustment, it is the information that he can earn seven monetary units by purchasing a resource which here is squandered and taking it there, where it is highly valued. Not only is this information created, but it is also transmitted or communicated in successive waves in the market and we will see this together throughout the course. For when Mr. C comes into contact with Ms. B and buys her resource, he is transmitting new information to Ms. B, which alters her map of knowledge. What information does Ms. B acquire ex novo? Well, what do you know? It turns out this resource I thought was a curse is actually worth something. I was ugly Betty, fat, knock-kneed, covered with pimples, etc. But it turns out I have a certain charm in some situations, and somebody has noticed me. That has changed my life, because it has changed my knowledge. What knowledge has been transmitted? Ms. B should save the resource she used to waste or misuse, because it is in demand at a good price. Information is also transmitted to Mr. A. He was frustrated because he could not achieve his aspired end due to a lack of resource R, which he needed to accomplish this end he so desired. Now he receives the information that the resource is available, that he can go on with his project and complete that stage. And completing that stage is not only an end in itself, it also opens the horizons for many other ends that will occur to him afterward. So, the creation of information from nothing, the entrepreneurial act. The moment the entrepreneur recognizes a profit opportunity, information he or she lacked a fraction of a second earlier emerges in his or her mind. The entrepreneur has created something. When Mr. C, for instance, acts entrepreneurially, he transmits part of that information to those involved in the entrepreneurial act, specifically Ms. B. He communicates to her that she should save the resource she was wasting, as it is in demand at a good price. There are people who need it, and Mr. A can complete his action, because that resource is available. He can go forward with his life projects. Indeed, according to my definition, when we transmit something to someone, we cause that person to generate in her mind information she did not have before, information we had at least partially discovered or created ourselves. When I say I am now transmitting knowledge to you, 
You must not interpret that in physical terms. It's not as if I had a kind of tube here which I could just connect up and fill your minds with knowledge. No. Instead, I am giving you a stimulus that encourages your creativity. You are practicing economic science yourselves. Though it is true that I am directing you, stimulating you, guiding you, you yourselves are creating and discovering knowledge, and you should be very proud of that. When we transmit something to someone, we enable that person to create or discover information which, in part, we have already discovered ourselves. Here you are, acquiring knowledge, but each of you is acquiring it in his or her own way. You are listening to me, and each of you is applying my words differently, as you immediately and almost inevitably try to adapt them to your own life circumstances, and enrich the seed you are creating. Notice we lack terms to describe such abstract realities. I have transmitted this seed to you, and you will take it with you, and it will continue to germinate. And tonight, as you sleep, it will sink in further. Your subconscious will kick in, and tomorrow you will be different people. Thanks to me? No, thanks to you, because you are creating something through listening to me. That is the transmission or the communication of information. The same is true for audio-visual communication. You are simply using a specific medium. Of course, a picture is worth a thousand words. But the knowledge you are transmitting is essentially subjective and practical. It is entrepreneurial and inarticulate, and it suggests things and awakens feelings and emotions. There lies the difference between a great film director or a great screenwriter and a blockhead whose only interest is putting a hand into the coffer and receiving state subsidies. However, not only is information created and transmitted, but there is something even more remarkable. The entrepreneurial act is coordinating. It coordinates. For once it is performed, people who previously acted with no awareness of each other in a discoordinated manner, the person who squandered water upstream on a river when someone downstream needed it, the person who expected to remain single forever and so didn't take care of herself when there was someone who could have been very happy at her side, the person who thought garbage was a curse, the trash you throw away is our mainstay, when, if properly treated, some waste can be turned into fertilizer, or the curse of Texas, oil, when, if processed at a refinery, it becomes gasoline and makes the internal combustion engine possible. These situations arise in all areas of life. Two people who used to perform their actions with no awareness of each other, in a maladjusted, discoordinated manner, learn. They learn, and in the best way possible, that is, motu proprio, of their own volition. They do not learn because they are commanded from above to attend classes at certain times, but because they realize learning is in their best interest. They each learn to discipline their behavior. And do you know what disciplining your behavior means? It means tightening your belt. And I'm going to tighten my belt, if I have another hole left for the buckle. We learn to discipline our behavior. To sacrifice and to make an effort in connection with another person. And we learn to do so in the best way possible to learn, spontaneously, with the idea that we will then better achieve our goals. And that is what makes life in society possible. From the time we get up in the morning and at 6 a.m. somebody has left milk for us, do you think it's enjoyable to get up at 4 in the morning to bring us our newspaper and our milk? Do you think it's pleasant to change the diaper of someone who is ill or elderly, or to collect the garbage, etc.? And yet we do these things happily, because we each learn to discipline our behavior in terms of the needs of others. We do so without anyone's commanding us, without reading it in the official state gazette, without the direction of a public official, but simply in our pursuit of entrepreneurial profit. When we discipline our behavior and save something we find unpleasant and do so happily because we're going to sell it at a good price, we are acting in tune with the needs of others we may not even know, and that is the most amazing thing of all. We may never meet them. I will never meet the person who made my watch, nor the one who made my shoes, nor the one who enables me to see with my contact lenses. There is merit in helping our neighbor, but it is relative because our neighbor is near us. And if he starts to cry, almost everyone will feel his heart soften and hand him a little money. What really has merit is to help millions of people you have never met and will never meet. 
people in another part of the universe. And that is what we do every day in the capitalist process of the globalized world, a process driven by entrepreneurship. The act of coordination or adjustment, all maladjusted behavior, whenever a human being acts without an awareness of or against the interests of others, this maladjustment takes the form of a profit opportunity, which remains latent to be discovered by an army of entrepreneurs, each and every one of us. This discovery can be made by the people involved or by a third party, who, the moment he or she notices the profit opportunity and acts to take advantage of it, triggers the effects of the creation of information, the transmission of information, and coordination or adjustment. A little later, we will take another step and explain that in the majority of entrepreneurial acts, this do at des, this exchange, is expressed as a price in monetary units. We will explain that the information embodied in prices is transmitted in successive waves, so to speak, throughout the entire market, and it permits the multilateral coordination of millions of people. A simple price transmits, in a highly compressed form, a huge volume of practical knowledge, which facilitates the coordination of all human beings. Let's imagine there is a forest fire in Brazil, and as a result, the world's stock of wood decreases, and in turn, the price of wood increases. Without our being aware of what has happened, without our knowing about the fire, nor its causes, we will all discipline our behavior, and instead of buying a wooden pencil, we will buy a plastic one, etc. Everyone will tune his or her behavior to the new circumstances. Furthermore, we will see that in the face of global warming, etc., the spontaneous market process alone can offer a solution to all the problems and challenges we which arise. The spontaneous market process and not organization, planning or social engineering from above.